This is It's a Mystery Podcast. Let us tell you a story. Hello, mystery readers, and welcome to episode 82 of It's a Mystery Podcast. I'm your host, Alexandra Amore. I'm a mystery author, and I'm here today with an interview for you with Michelle Cox. Michelle writes mysteries set in the 1930s in the Chicago area, and also there's a book that goes to England. Um, so I really think you're going to enjoy this interview. Her books have been described as Downton Abbey meets Miss, the Miss Fisher mysteries. So they've got that historical bent, a little bit of upper class stuff going on, and um, a feisty heroine in Henrietta. So I think you'll enjoy hearing Michelle um, read from one of the books. And then uh, at the back end, we talk about uh, the stories and her inspiration and her fascination with that period of time. So that's about it for this intro. The one thing I did want to say was um, I've noticed a lot of people on social media and that kind of thing mentioning that they're bored and that they're, you know, consuming a lot of entertainment, of course, which we would be a natural inclination to do at this time. It's the third weekend of April in 2020 as I record this and we're all weathering this challenging and um, unprecedented period of time. And I just wanted to mention that if you're feeling a little bored, if that's something that you're dealing with, that creativity and creation are a really great way of dealing with boredom. And maybe you want to just consider that there's some sort of creative creative skill or project that you've long wanted to approach and you haven't had the time until now. Now, it could be that you're run ragged with kids at home and trying to work from home and balance all that stuff. But if you're like some people that I've seen um, on social media expressing that they're a little bit bored with not being able to go out and socialize and all that kind of stuff, um, yeah, why don't you, you know, pick up a pencil and, and learn to draw or, you know, think about, is there something that you've always wanted to learn to do? Maybe play a musical instrument or something like that and just have never had the time for and might have the time for now. So that's just my little suggestion or tip. Um, Creativity is a balm for my soul, and I'm never bored um, because I'm always creating, uh, writing every week and every week creating this podcast. And it really, um, yeah, fills me up and And it's fun to put creative stuff out into the world. It's intimidating at first, of course, but you get over that eventually. So just a little suggestion from me. I hope you're doing well and staying safe. And uh, I'll leave you now with this interview and reading from Michelle Cox. And I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Michelle Cox is the award-winning author of the Henrietta and Inspector Howard series, which is a historical mystery romantic suspense series set in Chicago in the 1930s. It has been described as Downton Abbey's Miss, Miss Fisher's murder mysteries and has won over 40 awards to date. Likewise, the series has been praised by Library Journal, Kirkus, Booklist, Pop Sugar, Publishers Weekly, L, Brit & Co., and many, many more. Michelle lives in the Chicago suburbs with her husband and three children, where she is hard at work on a new novel. Before writing took over her life, she used to enjoy gardening, baking, big band music, and the odd board game. So welcome to the show, Michelle. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So you're going to read to us now from um, A Child Lost, which is book five in the Henrietta and Inspector Howard series. Uh So uh, take it away whenever you're ready. Yes. Okay. Sounds great. Um, Okay. This is uh, chapter 12. Good afternoon, sir, madam, Billings said crisply as he opened the front door of Highbury to Clive and Henrietta. I trust you've had a pleasant afternoon. He gave a slight bow as he stepped aside to allow them inside. Tolerable Billings, thank you, Clive answered tersely, handing him his hat and coat. The short drive home from Crow Island had been fraught with a variety of emotions. First tears on Henrietta's part, and then excitement as she began to enthusiastically chatter about Madame Pavlovsky's 
extraordinary clairvoyance. For his part, Clive had said little, allowing Henrietta to ramble on, all the while trying to decide how to proceed in this delicate situation. He looked over at Henrietta now as she removed her hat and could see that her eyes were still slightly puffy and red. If Billings noticed, as he took her things, he had the discretion not to say anything. Any messages, Billings? Yes, sir. Two telephone messages, sir. I've laid them in your study. There's one for you and one for madam as well, he said, nodding at Henrietta. Very good, Clive answered briskly, rubbing his hands from the cold. Is my mother at home? Yes, sir. She's upstairs in the long gallery with Mr. Bennett. Upstairs with Bennett? Whatever for? I really couldn't say, sir. Perusing the art before dinner, I think, is what Mrs. Howard said. Perusing the art? Since when did his mother care about art? His father had forever been trying to interest her in it, especially as they possessed so many priceless works, but he had failed to ever spark in her any real appreciation for it, besides how it might elevate them in the eyes of their peers. Is Bennett staying for dinner? He asked Billings. It would seem, sir, Billings said emotionlessly. Clive wondered why Bennett was showing up so regularly these days and dreaded having to later confer on more issues regarding the firm. He had a feeling Bennett was here to implore him to make an appearance downtown. It had been a while. Still, he could have requested his presence via telephone, could he not? Perhaps he had more documents for him to sign, Clive guessed with a sigh, trying not to be irritated. I see. Well, we'll be in the study, he informed Billings, and looking over at Henrietta inclined his head toward the direction of the study. Very good, sir. The study was deliciously warm and inviting as the two made their way in. The fire had been recently tended, Clive noted with approval, and several lamps in the corners had been left on presumably in anticipation of their arrival. Clive felt himself relax a little and poured two sherries. He handed one to Henrietta, who had eased herself onto the sofa, and then sat down beside her. Clive, she began, you've said so little. Why? Do you... Do you not believe what Madame Poblaski told us? Clive did not respond, but merely sat looking at her one arm stretched across the back of the sofa. You don't, do you? She asked incredulously. But how can you possibly explain her knowing all those things about my brother and sister, about me, about me losing the baby? She asked with what uncomfortably sounded like desperation. And what about your father? Clive sighed and took a drink of his sherry, reflecting that he should have poured himself a brandy. All the way home, he let her go on about their encounter with Madame Pavlovsky, not wanting to reveal his skepticism for fear of how she would take it. He had been trying to think of a way to gently expose this woman to be the fraud that she so obviously was, but he loathed to, as Henrietta seemed to derive so much comfort from her words. He hated the unavoidable task before him of telling her that it was false comfort. But that was the trick of these charlatans, wasn't it, Clive knew? To play on people's emotions, to get them where they were vulnerable. And what better way to get people than through their dearly departed? Clive knew a huckster when he saw one. And yet, a tiny part of him did wonder how she had known about Lindley. The rest he could explain away. But that one detail was harder. She must have done her homework. But how would she possibly have known they were coming in order to research? That was hard to explain away as well. Clive sighed. Darling, we have to look at this rashly. As detectives, he reminded her. I am. No, you're not, darling. The truth is that she read you, and she's very good at guessing. How could she have possibly guessed all those things, Clive? Henrietta asked irritably. He had hoped to avoid this, but he saw there was no other way than to be brutally honest. Henrietta, he began tentatively, you fed her the information. Think about it. She tells us that she communicates with the dead and then vaguely says she sees children. Aha! But that's just a good guess. 
Every family has at least one child who has died. You yourself gave her the information she needed by asking if they were siblings and even suggested that they were a boy and a girl. Henrietta took a sip of her sherry, apparently thinking this through. But how do you explain her knowing that I lost a baby? She asked finally. Remember, she said, losing a child isn't being ill. Another good guess. You distressfully asked her if she saw a baby. So she guessed you'd lost a baby. That's a bit of a stretch, Clive admitted. Well, like I said, she's good at guessing. Well, what about mentioning your father? She asked pertly. Howards are obviously well known, Clive said with what he hoped was a nonchalant shrug. She could easily know that he had recently died. And her mention of Castle Linley? She could have somehow researched that. A book on heraldry or English estates, something like that. Or she could have asked one of the servants. Really, Clive, she exclaimed, letting out a deep breath. What utter nonsense. You can't believe she would go to all that effort. For what? And she couldn't have known who we were or that we were coming. A con will go a long way for a sting, Henrietta. A sting? For what purpose? What can she possibly gain by telling you that your father loves you? My trust, he responded, an eyebrow arched. Henrietta shot him an icy look, and he knew he had upset her. He rubbed his forehead. It was hard to explain this woman's knowledge of Lindley, but he refused to give in to such nonsense. It could still have somehow been a guess, he tried to convince himself, remembering that these types of charlatans relied on fear and superstition to ply their trade. There must be a rational explanation, he knew, and he was determined to figure it out. And what about her telling us that our work at the hospital or the infirmary isn't done? Henrietta went on. Could she be referring to Anna, seeing as she's at an orphanage and apparently the only loose thread? Maybe the infirmary is a reference to her illness, she suggested. Clive thought of several negative things he wanted to say in response to these questions. But after a moment's consideration, decided to simply remain silent. Or could she have meant Dunning, Henrietta went on. Something we missed, maybe. Clive sighed. Not this again. Darling, I'm sure there are many unrighted wrongs at Dunning. But it is not our job to uncover them all. We've been through this. But what's to become of that little girl, Clive? She asked momentarily, confusing him by shifting subjects. The poor thing's lost her mother. No father to speak of and apparently an epileptic. It's awful, Clive. She needs proper medical care, not to be stuck in in some sort of orphanage or asylum because of it, somewhere like Dunning. That's cruel. Her voice caught a bit. Clive let out a deep breath. Of course he felt sorry for this girl, but there were thousands more out there just like her. In some ways, he knew she was lucky to be in some sort of institution. He had seen too many children living on the street. He had been like Henrietta when he first began police work after returning from the war. He had wanted to right all the wrongs, stop the suffering and the poverty and the pain he saw on the streets. But the emotional toll had been great, and the chief finally had to have a word with him. They couldn't save them all, he told Clive kindly over a whiskey. Their job was to catch the criminals, stop them from hurting more innocent people. They weren't running a charity, he told Clive sternly, and ended their session by suggesting that Clive choose between being a detective and a social worker. Both of them were needed, he pointed out, but not at his station. So Clive had chosen detective work and learned to harden his heart a little. The chief was right. He needed to see things objectively and not let pity get in the way. But then he had met Henrietta and his cold heart nearly froze him from both the war and his subsequent detective work began to thaw until it had melted completely, making him more alive than he had ever had, as well as uncomfortably vulnerable. Again, he wondered how running a detective agency was really going to work. They were already stumbling, and this was an easy case. Well, the Madame Pavlovsky case was anyway. In his mind, Lisa Klinkhammer's death was not a case at all, though there was something niggling there he had to privately admit. 
He just didn't know what, and he dared not tell Henrietta. She needed no encouragement to see things where there were none. It was better to treat this poor woman's death as a charity case, as his chief would have called it, and let it lie. Surely we can help her somehow, Henrietta was saying. It can't be left up to Gunther. I feel sorry for him, too. He was trying to do the right thing, and now he's caught up in this mess, with no one, nothing to help him, besides Elsie, I suppose, which isn't saying much. She's already overwhelmed. Surely we could at least pay for the girl to be examined by a reputable doctor. Clive rubbed his chin. Yes, I suppose we could do that, he said. Upon meeting Gunther the other day, Clive found that he liked him more than he thought he would, though it was a trifle hard to get past the fact that he was German. He wondered how old he was. He seemed too young to have fought in the war. His initial impression of him, however, had been good despite the circumstances. He appeared to be an intelligent sort, solid. He wondered about Elsie's interest and hoped she wasn't forming an attachment. Gunther didn't seem the lecherous type, but still... There would be no end of problems if Elsie developed feelings for him. We have to be careful, darling, he said now to Henrietta. Careful of what? Careful of getting too emotionally attached to our cases, he said gently. It's wise advice the chief once gave me. Our job is to catch criminals, not to help the victims. That's a different sort of thing altogether. Honestly, Clive, I don't see why not. What a curmudgeon you're being. And this isn't a case, so you keep reminding me. Please. She looked up at him with her big blue eyes, and he felt a rush of love for her. How could he deny her anything, especially something so easily in his power to grant? All right, you win, he said with a small wink. He drained his sherry and moved toward the desk to refill his glass. I'll make some inquiries but no guarantees, he added, noticing the phone messages Billings had mentioned, lying neatly on the right-hand side of the blotter. He picked up the one addressed to him and opened it. I'm not sure there's much we can do for the girl, he said absently as he began to read and then tossed it back onto his desk. Doubtless, Gunther has some plan of his own, Clive went on, looking at Henrietta now. Maybe he'll go back to Germany. Go back to Germany? That's ridiculous. Here, this is yours, I believe, he said, handing her the folded message with Mrs. Clive Howard scrawled across the front in Billings's tiny, neat handwriting. He watched as she opened it and quickly read it. Anything of interest? He asked, taking another drink. It's from Lucy. She wants me to telephone her back as soon as I can, Henrietta said with a frown. Ah, and yours? Our missing Mr. Tobin rang, he said. I'll telephone him back after dinner. Perhaps he will agree to meet with us. Hopefully, Mrs. Tobin will also be on hand and we can get to the bottom of this whole mess. Henrietta did not respond, but merely took a drink as she looked at him. She was thinking something he could tell. I think you're afraid, Clive, she said finally. Afraid that Madame Pavlovsky is not really a fraud, that she's real. Clive tried not to audibly sigh. Hardly, darling, he said, trying instead to force out a chuckle. There are much scarier adversaries out there than the likes of Madame Pavlovsky. Scarier than someone who can talk to the dead, she countered. We can all talk to the dead, Henrietta. It doesn't take much effort. I myself talk to my father every day. You know what I mean, Clive. Now he really did sigh. How had they gotten back to square one? There's something about her, Henrietta went on as she rose, presumably to dress for dinner. It was getting late. Something I just can't explain. Nice. Well done. Thank you for that. You're welcome. That was fun. Oh, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. So I just want to go back and talk about the origin of the series. So the first book is called um, A Girl Like You, and it, it begins in 1935. And what year are we in, in the scene that you just read? Um, that's a good question. It, it, the, the time does not f- travel very fast in the series. So um, it's probably still like 1936 or 19, early 37. 
Okay. So we're in between the wars, in other words. Think book five. Yes, it is 37. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, we're still in between the wars. So right. the war I'm referring to is the World War One. Right. Okay. So. And um, I noticed one of the things that you mentioned on your website in your bio, I think, is how much you enjoy that era that, you know, the 30s in between the wars. Um, and so... Mm-hmm what was the origin of the series for you? Like, obviously it came from an enjoyment of that time. Well, it's a good question. Um, it's actually, uh, based, it, it, it was never meant to be a series. Uh, let's okay. start there. So <laughs> I, I just was going to write one mystery book. <laughs> yeah. And I based it off a woman, uh, that I met in a nursing home when oh, I worked wow. there. Yeah. So Henrietta is based on a real person. Yeah. So then, um, I, I really, at the time, had more of an affinity for the 40s, but she had this amazing life in Chicago, and she used to say that she had a man-stopping body once upon a time (laughs) and a personality to go with it. I know, right? She was really a firecracker. So she had all these stories and all of these strange jobs um, going through the Depression, Um, so she it wasn't hard for her to get a job because of her, you know, I think because of her looks, but uh, it was hard for her to keep a job because she was um, very virtuous and she would slap owners or managers for trying to feel her up in the back room. She'd be (laughs) out. So she had this long string of jobs. Like um, she worked at the world's fair in, in 1933 and she worked as a taxi dancer and all of those things in the book are really real. Uh, and so I thought, gosh, I just, I love that detail of her working at the world's fair. She had to dress up like a Dutch girl every day. So I really wanted to set the book in the thirties. Had I known that I was writing a series, I might not have, but now I'm glad actually, because I do think, um, you know, there's so much out there about World War II already. And this kind of is a nice, um, you know, kind of that forgotten decade. So I really enjoy it. Okay, great. And one of the things you mentioned about um, Henrietta in the description for the first book, uh, A Girl Like You, you mentioned that she worked as a 26 girl at a bar. And I don't know what that is. What is that? Yes. I had to research that too. Apparently this is a real job that this woman had and it is a real thing. Um, it, it, I, as far as I could research, it was uh, local to Chicago only. So it was a dice game and it was p- played in taverns, sometimes in cigar stores. And um, you would roll, I think it was 13 dice and you would try to get a perfect score of 26. And if you did, you got a free drink on the house and they had these girls, these taverns would employ these, employ these girls called 26 girls and they were supposed to um, keep score, but really they were pushing drinks. So mm. that was a real, a real occupation. Yeah. Back then. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. I had no idea about that. Um, and so when you're, yeah. when you're research or thinking about writing your next book, um, do you find that your yeah. ideas come from research or do you have the idea first and then go and research it? I have the idea first and then I go and research deep. Um, you know, this, if I wrote another one, it would be book six and it's, it's really more, it's, it's kind of a progressive series, obviously. So there's a mystery in each book book that wraps up at the end but it's really more about these character arcs that you know it's this big saga and there's all these subplots now going and weaving in and out so book six would really have to be more about you know progressing those characters on um and so i come up with some sort of you know idea and then you know if i have to go back and research that i'd love for them to go in book six back to England and maybe get up caught up in some sort of pre-war type of stuff. So it'd be fun. Yeah. (laughs) And so we begin in Chicago. The first book is in Chicago and then they go to England. Is that, is that right? Uh, They go to England in book three. 
um, because that's their, their book three is like the wedding and the honeymoon. So they go to, um, Clive's uncle is, um, Lord Lindley and they have this sort of crumbling estate in England. And so they go there, um, so to sort of meet the family and then they were, they're going to go on and to France and Italy and all these places, but there's a, a murder occurs in the, vi- in the village and they stay and solve it. And then, um, well, I won't tell you, but, um, they have to quickly come back to the U S and, you know, a- end their honeymoon for a certain reason. So they're there for a little while. So right. Clive promises her that he will bring her back eventually. So I'm thinking maybe that will be book six. Ah, okay. okay. And what was it like for you writing yeah. a book based in England rather than Chicago? Um, you know, it wasn't that hard for me. I'm married to a Brit and oh, okay. I studied abroad um, for, yeah. So I was kind of, so because my husband's family is there, we we have gone there many, many, many times mm. and I'm a secret Anglophile at heart. So it's all sort of there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's, well, that's good. good. That must've made it easier for you. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't hard. Yeah. And so we talked a little bit about Henrietta. And so maybe just as a sort of a final question, um, tell us a bit more about Clive and he's a police inspector, a detective. Yeah. Um, yeah. So give us a little bit more about his character. Um, so Clive, um, something that he doesn't tell Henrietta in the first book is that he, which, you know, I had to quickly add, uh, when I decided to make it into a series, um, because I didn't really want to write about a cop and his wife in the thirties in Chicago. I felt like that had maybe already been done. So, um, he is actually the heir to the, um, Howard estate in Winnetka, which is a very wealthy northern suburb. So he has been sort of running from this since he was in the war and he has a lot of PTSD and he really doesn't want to have anything to do with that life. But after he meets Henrietta, then things begin to change. And he has, um, like I said, he's been through the war, so he's a bit scarred there. He was already married and um, his wife uh, passed away um, while he was overseas fighting. So he has that, carries that sort of secret sorrow as well. So he's... um, He's sort of this aloof character, um, but he decides to give his heart to Henrietta, but he's very, very, very overprotective of her. So that's constantly one of their um, battles between them is that she's very spunky and independent and she that's one of the reasons he loves her, but he's terribly frightened um, at the same time. So it's an interesting dynamic. Yes. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Well, this has been great, Michelle. It's been lovely chatting with you. So why don't you let everyone know where they can find out more about you and your books? Sure. Um, You can find me on michellecoxwrites.com. That's my website. And um, you can find all of my links to um, all the social media platforms. If you want to follow me, that would be great. Please sign up for my newsletter. I have tons of contests, like big contests, all all the time for just subscribers and you can follow me and find out where I'm going to be next and what I'm up to. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much again. It was lovely chatting with you. Thanks. Thanks so much. It was fun. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. You can always find episode show notes and links to the books mentioned on the show at itsamysterypodcast.com. While you're there, you can also grab your copies of two free mystery novellas by me, Alexandra Amore. Until next time, happy reading!